Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our last full week. Uh, this week, we've got two topics again. Our first one, which I'll just jump straight into here, is can machines think? Um, really, this question of, of machine consciousness. So we've got one film for this, Chappie. Um, and today, we're going to take a brief look at how this comes up in Chappie, and then also take a look at our first reading on this, which is the piece by Hilary Putnam. So Chappie, 2015 film uh, by the same director as Elysium, Neil Blomkamp. Um, I'm, I'm curious if any of you have um, you know, particular feelings on whether or not it, I should try to avoid including two films by the same director or not, or in particular, these two films. Um, and just in general, I'll, and I'll throw this out here now, um, course evaluation should open for this course relatively soon. I haven't gotten the email that they are open yet, um, but they should be open if, if they aren't already relatively soon, sometime over the next week or two. Uh, and I'd really love to get your feedback on those, uh, about what you liked in the course, what you didn't like in the course, um, and topic and, and movie selection and, and reading selection. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Were there any films that you really wish had been in the course? Are there any films that were in the course that you just really didn't like? Uh, are there any topics uh, or, or readings, same questions, you know, uh, things that you'd hoped would be in the course but weren't, or things that were in the course and, and really didn't work for you? So please feel free to share all that in the course evaluations, as well as your thoughts about other elements of the course as well, you know, the, the activities, the forums, the, the papers, the instructions, um, whether or not you found these lecture videos helpful or, you know, if they were just excessively long and boring. Whatever it might be, I'm, I'd love to get your feedback, whether it's, it's positive or negative, really honest feedback is all I'm looking for. So in this film, in, in Chappie, um, of course we've got the, you know, the, the whole plot unfolds and um, I think it's fairly interesting. The basic idea here is that Chappie is uh, the first truly artificial intelligence. So Dion, uh, Deb Patel over there on the, the right, um, on the, the poster, um, creates this, this program and loads it up into one of these um, police robots, concept sort of recycled from Elysium, but something else is, is done with it, which I think is interesting. Um, so uploads this, and then you know, Dion pitches the, the creation of artificial intelligence. Um, you know, True AI will be creative, it can learn, um, you know, it can create poetry, it can paint what she shows Chappie how to do. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a full, real thinking, feeling entity. Um, now, of course, that gets shot down. Um, you know, it's he, he's working for a military uh, police company, a you know, security company. So that's not really what they're interested in, but he goes ahead and uploads Chappie anyway. And of course, um, the Chappie's body has been damaged and then the battery can't be replaced. So all of a sudden, not only is Chappie mortal, but Chappie is um, set to die pretty soon. And of course, this Chappie learns about this and all of a sudden Chappie has to go from you know, basically nothing at the at the start of being loaded up goes through this incredibly fast learning process, and then has to confront issues of mort mortality very quickly. And there, so there's a whole dimension in the film that we aren't exactly dealing with, at least not head on here, which is just questions of mortality and how we uh, you know face that ourselves. Um, we're not going to look at that, but we are going to look at later this week. Our second topic is personal identity. And for that, we are going to be um, looking at Chappie as well as another film, Moon. Okay, so just coming back to, to Chappie, so what should we be focusing on? Well, that the, the anxiety that Chappie feels, the, the distress he feels, or at least seems to feel, right? The, the behaviors he exhibits when he was learning about his mortality, as well as at other points in the film, um, in, in some ways it's it's a sad film. It's, it's somewhat upsetting as you go through it because, of course, here's Chappie 
really like an infant for you know the first part of the film where he's, he's conscious, where he's alive, where he exists, I suppose. Um, but he learns it and grows very quickly. But then, of course, we see him get frightened uh, and, and be in pain. And in particular, what I've got in mind here is when he's growing up and, of course, um, you know, through various uh, <laughs> plot developments, Chappie winds up being hostage to, or, you know, we might want to phrase that differently, um, this, this small group of, of thugs, um, Ninja, Yolandi, and, and America. And Yolandi takes on sort of a mothering role, trying to care for Chappie, uh, but Ninja wants Chappie to be toughened up. You know, he needs to, he, he really sees Chappie's instrumental value, um, that if they don't use Chappie to, to pull off this heist and get all sorts of money uh, to repay a debt that they've incurred at the start of the film, uh, they're going to be dead. And so Ninja really wants Chappie to toughen up and in trying to get him to do that, um, you know, loads him up in the van and takes him and just sort of drops him off in the wide world where Chappie gets attacked and abused and um, abducted. And actually, well, we, there's one character in the film who really embodies the the sort of con side on, on our question here. So, you know, this question, can machines think, right? Can they really think or feel? And there's a question here, and I'm gonna revisit it a few times as we're moving through, whether or not thinking or feeling is exactly the same thing. Um, our, our readings don't fully get into that, but I'm gonna flag that as an issue that you certainly can engage with if you want. But on the one hand, we have Dion, who certainly regards Chappie as being fully real. Um, in fact, Yolandi and, and Ninji, uh, Ninji, Ninja, um, probably America, I think that's perhaps a little less clear, certainly by the end of the film, come to see Chappie as, um, that th they regard him as a, a thinking, feeling being, or you know, sort of a full person in this sense. Dion certainly has that attitude right from the get-go. Uh, and But we have Vincent, who's played by Hugh Jackman, as really being, you know, not only sort of the, the villain, or one of the villains in the film, but also as really embodying the attitude that in fact Chappie and any robot are really not um, conscious beings. They don't think, they don't feel, um, they aren't real in some sense. And so when Ninja goes and drops Chappie off, this sort of middle of the film roughly, uh, sort of drops him off in the real world so he'll, he'll toughen up. Uh, and then Vincent actually finds Chappie and abducts him to get the, um, um, uh, the, the, the key back, the USB, the, the sort of unlock. I just had a total you know, brain fart. I had the, the word for it, exactly what it was, but um, abducts Chappie to, to get that back. Well, of course, Chappie's frightened and everything, uh, and, and Vincent teaches him a lesson, sort of cuts his arm off, and Chappie reacts in a way that he, he's frightened, but also might be experiencing pain, perhaps, right? Getting, getting that arm cut off. Um, and, and Vincent sort of whispers into his, well, not his ear, but I don't know, side of his head, uh, that Chappie isn't real, right? Um, that it's just wires and, and you know, electricity up there. He's not, he doesn't really exist, which I'm, I'm just gonna touch on this here now, and, and I don't think I'll probably come back to this. Uh, very interesting question there about how can you tell something it's not real. It doesn't have to be real to be able to understand and appreciate what you're telling it. This made me think, just watching it this time through, made me think of when we were talking about the Matrix and talking about uh, Bostrom and the simulation hypothesis. Um, you know, what if we are simulations, right? Not just that we're living in a simulation, but that we are, in fact, simulations ourselves. We aren't really flesh and blood human beings. We just think we are. What does that, well, you know, what, what does that mean? It means in some sense we're programs, right, or, or software. We're part of a, a system that's running. Uh, and then to be told that you're not real, this sort of inv invoked Descartes for me with, with Chappie. For Chappie to be able to sort of understand Vincent and what Vincent is saying that he's not real requires, I think, though maybe not, that Chappie is real, at least in some sense, to be able to take that information and process it and, and make sense of it. So there's there's an interesting question there about, you know, what, what's going through Vincent's mind when he 
expresses that, if he really thinks Chappie isn't real, what is he doing when he tells him that he isn't real? Like, what, what does he take his own action to be there? He couldn't really be telling Chappie he's not real because he couldn't tell Chappie anything if Chappie, in fact, isn't real and can't think or understand. So then what's Vincent doing? Maybe just expressing himself, but expressing himself in a, a funny sort of way, the way he would express himself if Chappie were real, but um, sort of mimicking that in a, a way to sort of insult and degrade Chappie. Okay, um, and so let's go ahead and jump over to take a look at Hillary Putnam, um, this piece from him. So today we're gonna look at, at Putnam, who is going to argue in favor really of the, the view that machines and you know, non-human organisms, broadly speaking, can think, can feel pain, um, the view called functionalism. So that's what we're gonna look at today. So this is really the, you know, in a nutshell, Putnam is the yes, Chappie is really a thinking, feeling being. Um, next day, we're gonna look at a piece by John Searle, who's going to really give a, a more philosophically articulate expression of Vincent's view than in fact, Chappie can't be a real thinking thing. He can't really think and feel. Why? Well, Searles being in a nutshell, because to do that, you have to have a certain kind of, of composition. You have to be made of the right kind of stuff. Humans are, right? We're carbon-based organic life forms. We've got certain things going on under the hood up here, right? We've got certain brain matter and so on. That's what's required for thinking and feeling. Chappie doesn't have it. Why? As Vincent puts it, it's all just wires and stuff. So there's the very simple view of what we're looking at over the next couple of days. So Putnam was a very influential American philosopher. Um, so you know, he uh, lived to be 90, um, died a few years ago. He worked in several areas and, and had an influence in several areas, including philosophies of mind, language, and science. Uh, he also worked in logic and uh, mathematics and a few other areas. But uh, to me at least, these are the areas where he had the, the most influence. Um, and he, he came along and really, uh, especially in the, the 1960s, 60s through sort of the 2000s, I'll say, um, had a really big influence in some of these areas in the philosophy of mind, language, and science. But he was also famous, perhaps a little infamous for at least seeming to flip flop on some of his main positions. So he'd come along in the 1960s or 70s and put forward a, a position um, that really shook things up and, and you know, got people talking and thinking in different ways. And then you know, a decade or two later, he would come out and, and be his own worst critic in some sense, saying, here are all the reasons why that thing that I was telling you about isn't going to work, um, which I always think is something very interesting because when you look at what Putnam's saying, and I'm not going to tell you here if, if he flip-flopped on what we're going to be looking at today, in some sense because I don't want to prejudice you. But when we look at what people say and the views they take and, and the arguments they put forward, one way to think about that is, you know, oh, I really like Putnam or whoever. So I'm just going to agree with whatever they said. Because, you know, if I, I liked what they said over in, um, about the mind, you know, then I'm sure whatever they said about language and science was great. But that's, that's a, a kind of laziness, right? Or at least it can be. It can also be its own form of bias. Um, and something I've been driving at in this course, and I tried to ar articulate early on, is that arguments and, and reasoning are really independent of the people who make them. So just because Putnam, you know, later Putnam disagreed with something earlier Putnam said, doesn't actually mean that earlier Putnam was wrong. It just means that later Putnam came to believe early Putnam was wrong. But of course, later Putnam, right, the older Putnam, could have been wrong instead. Right? He could have been right earlier in his life, and then later on came to hold a mistaken view, assuming we think that there are such things as you know, right and wrong views to be had. So you can't just take the fact that somebody says something as good evidence that in fact it's true. Um, of course, we should, we should be a little careful and not be too hasty on, on these sorts of matters. Uh, and when someone influential like say Putnam says something, um, as well as you know, influential people in all sorts of other domains, uh, when, especially when they, you know, have a history of knowing what they're talking about and, um, you know, made a splash and, and experts tend to get together and say, yeah, you know, there's, there's really something going on there. It gives us at least a reason for giving them our attention, right? We shouldn't just automatically assume they're right, 
but it does warrant, if we're interested in the, the subject at hand, warrants us spending our time and energy on trying to figure out if they're right. Because, you know, all sorts of people have all sorts of beliefs about all sorts of things, but it doesn't mean it's really worth our time and energy trying to consider each and every one of them. Right? If you want to go on, I, I don't know, Twitter, Facebook, or whatnot, uh, you're going to find millions of opinions about millions of subjects. But even if you're interested in lots of those subjects, it's not always worth your time to really go through and, and give a full consideration of each and every one of them because there are only so many hours in a day. Okay, let's set that tangent aside and move on to the piece itself, The Nature of Mental States, which he originally published in 67 and then he republished in the collection that I've, I've taken the scan from in 1975. So this piece, I've broken it into three sections again. Uh, first, examine some issues concerning the use of language and mental properties. So I'm gonna talk about that first section he's got there. It is a little confusing, but we'll try to make some sense of it. Second, proposes the functionalist theory of mind. This is the, the one I was talking about. It's on this theory that we can assert that Chappie is indeed a thinking and most likely feeling being. And then third, ex uh, Putnam examines the strengths of the functionalist theory compared to other theories of mind. So we're gonna hear a little bit about some other theories and why it is Putnam thinks that they don't work as well as his proposed alternative. Okay, so first, identity questions. So Putnam begins with some remarks about analytic philosophy. Analytic philosophy roughly is the kind of philosophy uh, that, that at least certainly was most dominant in Anglo-American philosophy in sort of the, the early to mid 20th century, uh, 1920s, especially 1930s through uh, 1960s or so. And, and this, you know, Putnam's piece, 1967, in the 60s and 70s, there was something of a reaction to traditional, at that point, you know, traditional analytic philosophy. Uh, and part, uh, Putnam is one of those critics saying, you know, there's, there's something fishy going on in this older tradition we have here, uh, which itself, you know, was relatively young, historically speaking, but itself tried to uh, put aside a lot of, of traditional issues in the history of philosophy uh, and, it's, and try to take what it regarded as really the best insights in philosophy and science and, and bring those together and create a kind of a logical mathematical foundation for proper knowledge which they regarded as ultimately being scientific in nature. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of leave it at that. He says a lot in that first section. Um, I could spend a lot of time, I could spend an hour here probably trying to explain everything that's going on in that first section that's a couple of pages long. I'm not going to do that because it's in many ways beside our point here. Um, I did ask you to read it anyway because I think it's worth seeing how he's setting things up and what I'm going to say here I think should help make sense of at least enough of what he's saying there that that section should make sense and, and his setup is uh, sensible. It's also some good, good experience seeing just how you know dense and um, in some ways technical philosophy certainly can be. So in that section Putnam is talking about a couple of uh, um, terms uh, meaning or intention and uh, reference or, or extension. So philosophy of language is something that got really big in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. Um, so there's sort of a move from logic and, and science to looking at language more seriously. Uh, and so these, these issues with language are, you know, close to the heart for Putnam because he was, he worked seriously on those as well as so several other uh, issues as, a, as I've mentioned. Now, there is this view that traced back to that uh, analytic philosophy program that was uh, sort of in vogue in the 1930s that um, really the meaning of a, a concept, its intention, what, what we as individual thinkers or speakers mean when we use a word um, is really the same as what it refers to, that there's no such thing as, um, you know, you and I sort of meaning something different by a concept or a term, even when it refers to the same thing. Now, Putnam instead thinks, at least here in this piece, like, again, right, whenever I'm talking about Putnam here, 
to recognize that it's Putnam in this piece, not sort of Putnam overall general for everything he ever wrote, but in this piece, this is the position he's taking up. Uh, he holds that we can have two concepts with, with two different intentions, two different meanings for us, but that still have the same reference. So for instance, and this is the, the example that he makes use of quite a bit, um, when we're talking about temperature, right? There's a real question: what What is temperature exactly, right? Um, well, look, one view we could say, you know, temperature is heat, right? What is heat, right? If, you know, if we're trying to be if we're properly scientific and and trying to figure out exactly what terms mean and how higher order, or higher level terms uh, can be made sense of with more basic components or or more basic concepts, which really is you know, a lot of what the sciences are, are trying to do, take really complex phenomena, find ways of, of breaking it down to its simplest parts and, and getting very, you know, precise and hopefully manageable mathematical laws to actually make predictions and, and um, calculations explaining certain sorts of behaviors and so on. Um, when we're thinking about temperature, and Putnam himself says, look, you know, we've got to paper over a few things here, but let's, you know, just go with it here. Uh, Temperature might just be mean molecular kinetic energy, right? And that's, and really, Putnam says that that's what it is. That's what we figured out it is, right? This took time, right? It's not like, uh, um, you know, people in classical times in Greece or Rome or, you know, people in the Middle Ages before the notion of molecules really well known or before there's any way of measuring the mean molecular kinetic energy. Um, they certainly had a concept of temperature, right? Hot and cold and right, th this sort of thing. Um, and, and even the idea of, of temperature as something we can put a number on, right, we can measure it, you know, it be Fahrenheit, Celsius, right, we, uh, Calvins, we can make up other systems if we want. If we have some way of measuring temperature, right, we can assign some kind of number to it, it's, you know, 31 degrees today or whatever. Um, but of course, we say, okay, well, and what does that mean, right? What, what is temperature telling us? How does that map onto the world, right? Um, this is where we can say, well, that's really telling us what the mean molecular kinetic energy is. Now, Putnam's saying that temperature really just is mean uh, molecular kinetic energy, right? They're, they're identical, they're the same things, but our concepts for those two aren't the same thing, right? or at least certainly don't uh, have to be. So, you know, little children, right? Um, almost certainly learn what temperature is and, and get familiar with hot and cold and so on far before they can become familiar with mean molecular kinetic energy. So in fact, we can have two different concepts. We can have two different understandings of what these things are in the head, right? Our, our own heads. And it's really only over time that we come to realize that the one thing really is the other thing uh, and that we might sort of meld those two into one concept in our own mind. But in fact, they could be different, two different things. Now this might seem weird. This might seem like a strange way to start a discussion about whether or not machines can think. It, in some ways it is, but this is exactly the kind of thing Putnam was interested in. You know, if we wanna talk about, you know, can machines think, can machines feel? Well, we need to think a little bit about what are we, what are we saying? We say, can a machine think, right? If I say, yes, a machine can think, what am I saying? What am I asserting about it exactly? Um, what am I not asserting about? What sorts of things don't make any sense to say? What sorts of things, um, in fact, are, are sort of trivially true based on the things we already mean by our words, right? Um, because if by a machine, I mean something that can think, right? It's a digital device that can think. Well, then of course machines can think, but then that's completely unhelpful because now we're saying, okay, but then what, what do you mean when you say it's a digital device that can think, right? What, what are you meaning it's able to do? This is what Putnam is gonna to try to give us an answer to, though it's gonna be a very general uh, answer, a high level of abstraction, as we're gonna see. Okay, so Putnam uh, remarks on what he calls the correlation view. Now, this view holds that instead of an identity, we can merely say that two phenomena are correlated. So what, is, what does that mean? So look, um, for example, uh, here, so another another example from the sciences, right? Light really is just electromagnetic radiation, right? just like temperature really is mean kinetic energy, right? 
a molecular kinetic energy, right? It's, it's temperatures, it's how fast molecules are moving around. So when it's hot out, things are moving really quickly, right? When it's cold, they're moving very slowly. And of course, we experience that as, you know, we feel heat and cold in part because we're biological organisms and we really only have a, a certain range where we can survive. And, you know, there's a certain habitable zone for us. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just sort of say roughly minus 50 degrees Celsius to plus 50 degrees Celsius. We, you know, I'm not saying those are hard limits. And if you hit like 51 or, or minus 51, you know, you're going to die immediately. But, um, right, like there's a certain functional range between like minus 20 and plus 20. We're mostly pretty good as long as we've got some clothing and things like that to keep some warm. Uh, but, you know, once you hit like minus 30 and then plus 30 and then go out even further than that, uh, the temperature is really affecting how our body is operating. And then as a result of that, we experience the, the feelings of, of heat and cold we get. Now, light is electromagnetic radiation. And of course, this was another thing that was discovered, right, over time. Uh, it's not like people in ancient Rome knew that. Oh yeah, right, temperatures mean molecular kinetic energy and, and light is electromagnetic radiation. Rather, we had a sense of what light was and then electromagnetic radiation was discovered. Um, and then, right, there, there was a period of sort of scientific and philosophical sort of pondering about these things. How are they related to each other and so on? Uh, and then eventually it was decided that really the best theory is that light just is electromagnetic radiation. Now, of course, somebody could stamp their feet and say, no, right? The light's just correlated with electromagnetic radiation. That is, it, whenever you see light, there's electromagnetic radiation. Whenever there's electromagnetic radiation, there's light. But light isn't just the electromagnetic radiation, it's some other thing. Similarly, when we're talking about heat, somebody could stamp their feet and say, look, heat is correlated with mean molecular kinetic energy, but they're not the same thing. They're, they're two different things. But then, of course, we get these questions about, well, then what is light or what is heat if they're merely correlated with these other phenomena that we detect very, very reliably? Right? A similar view holds for um uh, sensations with brain states so one view that putnam wants to reject is that when we talk about having a sensation right as a thinking feeling being like you are and i am um you know to feel pain or to be frightened or to feel happy or to think about something right which itself arguably is a kind of sensation that might be sort of perverting language too much but uh, you know as i'm telling you things and you're thinking about them there's something going on up here, right? There's, there's something in your mental experience different from, but in some sense similar to what enters your mental experience when you, you know, touch something or feel something or, or ah, have a pain about something. I bet you didn't expect that one. I didn't, oh man. Okay. Um, so one view is that sensations just are brain states, right? Then when we feel, you know, a slap to the face, our brain is in a particular um, electrical, chemical state, right? Certain neurons are firing and whatever, right? Insert all the technical terminology here. I'm not trying to denigrate neuroscience. I just don't know enough about it to sort of convincingly fake my way through talking about what's, what's going on. But one view that, right, um, neuroscientists are, are sort of pursuing, I'll put it that way, this, this is, you know, at the center of a lot of the research, you know, what is going on in our brains when things like uh, feeling a slap or thinking about something or being afraid or whatever, right? Any kind of, of mental event we might have, right? Any sort of state we're in, what's going on in the brain at that time? So one view, right? The correlation view is that our sensations are just correlated with brain states, right? They aren't the same thing, but they always come together. Right? They, they're present or absent at the same time. Or we can take up the view that sensations really just are brain states. So you have to have a brain in a certain kind of configuration to have a certain kind of sensation or a certain kind of thought or feeling or whatnot. This is what we're gonna see Searle ultimately defend. Now, Putnam notes that uh, the, the correlation view, um, The view that he's talking about here, correlation versus identity, right? Whether or not um, sensations are just brain states or light just is electromagnetic radiation or heat just is uh, mean molecular kinetic energy, that'd be the identity view. 
correlation view is that they aren't the same thing, but they always come together or they're always absent together. Pundit notes that um, these two views exclude different sorts of questions from being meaningful. So for instance, if we maintain that light or sensations or whatever are something more than the physical process we identify as always being correlated with them, then we may ask such questions as what are they and why are they correlated or caused by such and such physical processes? If we regard them as just the same thing, as being identical to these other processes that we identify, then those questions are excluded. If sensations just are brain states, then once we've identified the brain state, there's nothing left to, to say, well, what is it really? Right. Okay, so coming around to the functionalist theory. So Putnam proposes this functionalist theory of mind, which he says is neither a correlation nor, nor the identity view. It's really something else. So what is it? Well, he, as he tells us, he says, I propose the hypothesis that pain or the state of being in pain is a functional state of a whole organism. Now, the organism is a probabilistic automaton, as he puts it, a plural probabilistic automata. Now, just a tiny little bit of, of history here. Um, the, he, and he talks about the, the Turing machine. Um, this piece is dated, it's, it's from 67. A lot has changed since 67, right? We've now got cell phones and, uh, you know, little miniature digital devices that are far more powerful than any kind of uh, computer that was around in, in 67. Now, Alan Turing was um, one of the, the sort of early um, developers of, of the computer, uh, worked in code breaking during uh, World War II for the British. Um, and of course, after they sort of used his intelligence to win the war for him, then persecuted him for his homosexuality, uh, as these things tend to go, right? as, long as, as long as he's helping the war effort, well, you know, who cares? And then once that's done, well, you know, good luck. Um, now, the probabilistic automaton is a, a kind of Turing machine. Now, a Turing machine is really a, a kind of computer. So, you know, Turing was, was thinking in the future as well. And um, you might have heard of the Turing test, which is really a kind of behaviorist approach to thinking about whether or not machines can think. So. Turing basically said, look, if we're thinking about can machines think, really what we should be asking is the question, can they behave in such a way that it seems like they're thinking? And this is really the idea that Putnam is in many ways running with in this piece, but he's, he's getting in some sense more advanced than Turing, at least in certain sorts of ways, uh, so, you know, philosophically, certainly at the time. Um, Turing was, or Turing machines were, you know, much like uh, modern computers in the sense of being uh, devices with one zero outputs, so that they're supposed to be deterministic, right? Um, you know, you get a certain kind of input, I hit space bar or whatever, a uh, machine does a certain kind of thing. There's a certain output that's necessitated by the input. Putnam, though, says that these probabilistic uh, automata that he's talking about, in fact, are probabilistic machines. This is the modification. They have probability outputs. So given a kind of input, right, say I press space bar, then the, the PA, the probabilistic uh, automaton, I'm probably gonna, just gonna say PA from now on, so make a mental note of that. Uh, it will have different probabilities of what's gonna happen. So as a Turing machine, my computer, the way it's operating, when I hit space bar, it's gonna go to the next slide. Uh, you know, it just, hap it just happens, 100%. But if it's a probabilistic automaton, then what's gonna happen you know, when I hit space bar? Well, maybe it's 60%, I go to the next slide. And there's a 22% that something else happens. And there's a 4% that this happens. Just like with humans, in fact, uh, Putnam says, you know, really anything under a certain description is a probabilistic automaton. Um, humans, chappy, right? Other biological organisms. Right? Uh, we don't know exactly what they're gonna do. Right, you come and tell me a joke or poke me in the head or whatever, right? Slap me in the face. Um, you know, what am I gonna do? Well, you don't know 100%, right? You, you don't have a full deterministic picture of exactly what's gonna happen next. But depending on the kind of information you have, you do probably have some kind of probability calculation, right? Well, it's highly likely this is gonna happen, but this also might happen or that might happen, right? And so on. So this is the, the sort of picture Putnam is working with. So 
he identifies a few different parts of the, uh, the PA, the probabilistic automaton, uh, and that's the description, functional organization, and total uh, state at any given time. So just a few words on these. Um, the description tells us about the various states the PA, in, uh, the PA may be in and how they relate to each other, right? So going from, uh, so look, if I'm the PA, and, and this is where the high level abstraction comes in, right? The probabilistic automaton can be almost anything, right? It can be a human, certainly. It can also apply to Chappie or an armadillo or a donkey or what, what have you, right? So the description tells us about the different sorts of states that can be in and how they relate to each other. So, you know, look, if I'm, uh, if I'm happy and then I get slapped in the face and it kind of hurts, I'm, you know, likely to become less happy. Though, of course, if I'm already upset and, and angry and everything, I get slapped in the face, uh, then there's, there's a higher probability I, I, you know, turn to the sort of thing that's throwing punches, right, or, or fighting back somehow, right? So the description is really a way of describing the, what, what's going on with the automaton at a given time. The functional organization tells us about the transition probabilities on the machine table. This, this is an old thing where he also talks about uh, tape, right? The computer writing on tape. Uh, and then he, he is sort of, you know, talking about robots and, and that's what he's thinking about because he's thinking about mechanical outputs and, and you know, moving about. But of course, he's in some sense a product of his time, but he's, he's thinking into the future. Right? If you go back in the 1960s and look at how they were thinking about, you know, the year 2000 or, you know, 2100 or something, and then you compare it to what, you know, technology we have today, it's often laughable in, in very interesting ways, right? Uh, and where's my hover car, right? Everybody said we'd have hover cars, and here we are, no hover cars. You know, smartphones, that's nice, but, you know, I want a hover car. So the... Functional organization, you, really, you can think about this as like the, uh, um, the internal setup in the software of a computer, right? Um, so look, when I, I can give a description about my computer and the sort of state it's in, and, you know, well, look, if I hit space bar, it's going to go to the next slide. The functional organization is, is sort of getting our hands a little bit dirtier about what's going on on the inside, especially once we have probabilities going on. Um, if my computer is not a perfect sort of one zero deterministic uh, um, device, but instead is, is functioning probabilistically that when I hit space bar, there are different things that might happen. The functional organization is really what's going on sort of under the hood, so to speak. Okay, and then the total state of the system at a given time tells us what state it's in and the probabilities of it transitioning to other states, you know, the system's next moves. Um, this is a little bit more. Um, uh, fully encompassing than the, the functional organization, uh, at least from the way I understand it, the way Putnam explains it here. So the functional organization is really this, you know, machine table, this, this kind of, let's call it program that it's running. The total state includes all of, of what's going on. So all the sensory information coming in. And of course, Putnam talks about this. He says, okay, you know, imagine something that, like a computer, right? It's like a Turing machine computer, really. That's what a Turing machine is basically. Um, but it's got sensors hooked up so it can detect the environment around it, right? Think chappy, right? Hearing and seeing and, and, you know, having different sorts of detection. And when we're thinking about humans, right, think about our, our sensory apparatus, right? You know, you see and hear and taste and touch and whatever. Um, you know, the fifth one, whatever that one was, smell, it's probably smell. Um, right, we have these different ways of, of getting information from our environment. And then, um, that sort of gets processed in a certain kind of way, depending on the state we're already in, that itself has some sort of bearing on what's likely to happen. So just going back to what I was saying, right, if I'm already happy, right, and I get slapped in the face, the way I'm gonna respond might be quite different, probabilistically speaking, than if I'm already like upset and angry and then get slapped in the face, right? If I'm already like arguing with somebody and then they slap me, Right, the reaction there might be quite different than you know sitting around having fun with friends and we're joking and then one of them gives me a slap. Right, like I might be bewildered. It might just be funny, maybe not. But it, there's a different likelihood of, of me doing things. Uh, you know what the outcome is going to be in those different sorts of situations, and that's really what Putnam is talking about when he's talking about these parts of the probabilistic automaton. Okay. Now, 
I'm just going to throw this up here. Uh, I, I don't even think I'll quite read all the way. Well, all right, I'll, I'll sort of talk about it briefly. I'm not just going to sit and read this whole thing. You can do that. It's in the piece. Uh, this is just pulled straight out of it, right, straight from Putnam. Um, so the first point, like I've already said, and Putnam sort of covers this, he says, you know, really anything um, under a certain description can be a probabilistic atom, um, automata, right? And particularly when we're thinking about humans, other biological animals, and think about robots like Chappie, uh, these are probabilistic automata. We don't know exactly what they're going to do next, but we can have certainly some idea about it. Uh, we can talk about their descriptions, their functional organizations, and their total states. The second point, so Putnam is particularly interested in this piece in thinking about the feeling of pain. That's really what he wants to talk about. Um, and so this comes back to what I was saying about thinking and feeling. Can we really distinguish those two? Um, could something, could a computer think but not feel? Or do we have to be able to feel in order to be able to think? Now here Putnam is interested in making the claim that um, organisms can feel, right, feel pain. Uh, and in particular, he seems to be talking about biological organisms other than humans here in this piece. Um, but there's really nothing in principle to restrict uh, functionalism to biological organisms. Uh, it can apply equally as well to a robot like Chappie. And in fact, in other papers, Putnam explicitly goes into that. And he even mentioned some of them in this paper and some of the footnotes. I didn't assign any of those because they're in some ways even more bewildering in terms of what he actually writes, um, which is not to say they aren't sensible, but this piece, sort of nice length, he gets to the main point, right? Get, gets that on the table for us. So this is why we're reading this one rather than some of the other ones. So uh, really for something to feel pain, um, it has to have a certain kind of description. Right, that feeling pain is really a certain kind of functional organization that can be described in terms of input output fun in input output functions. So, for me to be the sort of being that can experience pain, I'm the sort of being that when a certain kind of uh, when, when I get certain kinds of sensory information and I interpret that in a certain kind of way, right, I sort of process it, um, I react in certain sorts of ways. Right, that there's a certain kind of input coming in from my, my senses and the environment. I'm in some total state at the moment, and then there's a probability of me reacting in certain sorts of ways based on that. Right, so uh, I'm the sort of being that can feel pain. What does that really mean? Well, when there are um, experiences that are, are sort of not conducive to my survival or flourishing, right? I get cut or hit, or uh, you know the temperature is too hot or too cold, or I'm thirsty or hungry, or Right. Think about all the various causes of pain. Um, generally speaking, we're in pain when something's not going quite right for us. Um, I'm the sort of being that can be in pain. Why? Because when I'm in a situation like that, I'm getting the right kind of sensory information. Uh, the result is that I'm going to do something to try to um, sort of get away from the pain, right? Make it go away or stop. But it's not a 100% uh, the, you know, likelihood that that's going to happen. Why? Well, because sometimes we have good reasons to, to stay in pain, right? You know, you are, are trying to work out or something. It kind of hurts, right? You're going for a big run or something. Uh, but you want to be doing the thing, so you continue to do it. You go to the doctor, the dentist, or whatever. Um, you get put in pain, right? But you choose to be in that pain, right? You don't just sort of run away from it, in part because you know, it's, it's good for you in some sense, right? You go to the, the dentist, you get a tooth drilled and a filling put in. Why? Well, it hurts, but it's going to, you know, save you pain in the long run and, in fact, be good for the tooth's integrity. Right? So this is really what talking about in two, right? Um, so to be capable of feeling pain, it has to be um, an organism of some sort. It's probabilistic uh, automata. Right, or a probabilistic automaton, automatic plural. Um, anything that's capable of feeling pain possesses at least one of these descriptions. Right? Third, um, something can only feel pain uh, it, it, as a unit, right? as an entity, not as one of its parts. So look, my, my arms or fingers don't feel pain on their own. Rather, I, Carl, 
as a probabilistic automaton and the kind of thing that can feel pain. Now I can feel the pain in my fingers or whatnot, but it's not my fingers themselves that can, that are, are the sorts of things that can be in pain. Rather, I am the sort of thing that can be in pain, even if the pain feels localized in certain sorts of areas, right? Uh, and this comes back to what I was talking about with uh, Vincent sort of whispering to, to Chappie that he's not real. If Chappie can feel pain, it's because as a whole, he's the kind of thing that can feel pain, right? When it gets the arm cut off, um, as a whole entity, he can probably feel, well, okay, I, sh I shouldn't put it that way. If he can feel pain, it's because he's getting a certain kind of sensory input and then judges that's, you know, not the right sort of thing. And he has uh, a reaction, right? The, the functional organization is sort of telling him to get away from that. Even if after the fact, he just has a new arm stuck on, right? That does, just because he's able to be fixed easily, that doesn't necessarily mean that he wasn't in pain when it happened or even after it happened. Right? In fact, he seems very despondent and upset and so on when he goes back uh, and is, is talking to Eleni. All right, and then four. Uh, four is really getting, you know, sort of a little bit more technical. Um, when we're talking about what it is for an organism of some sort to be in pain, um, there are these the subset of sensory inputs, right? Uh, basically, the organism is only in pain when it has certain kinds of, of sensory inputs going on, right? What does that do? In effect, it excludes um, the ability of this theory to say that an organism is in pain even when it can't detect it, because that seems uh, incoherent, right? Uh, unconscious pain, at least on, on some level, right? When we're talking about just the feeling of pain seems somehow non nonsensical which is not to say something in our subconscious or unconscious cannot be the source of some kind of pain that we might perhaps do feel. Okay, so I hope that makes sense of this. Um, hopefully it'll make even a little bit more sense in looking at how Putnam uh, contrasts the functional theory, uh, this, this functionalism, to a couple of other theories. So he contrasts it to the brain state theory. Like I already said, the, the brain state theory, oh, here, I'll stick this up. Um, what the brain state theory wants to do is really identify sensations like you know being in pain or, or feeling pain with being in a certain kind of brain state. So to be in pain would just be to you know, be in brain state. You know, we can give it a number or, or whatever, right? The pain brain state that your brain is in a certain kind of configuration. Uh, and that's, that's just what it is to be in pain. When your brain is whatever this is, right? I'm sure there's a lot more complicated stuff going on than that. I don't even know if it's the same thing anymore. Um, one view is that to be in pain is just to have your brain in that certain state, right? And if we stuck you in an MRI or, or whatever it was, uh, and we checked everybody's brain when we slapped them in the face or whatever, you know, put them in pain, if we found the exact same state all the time, that's really what the brain state theory would be holding. But Putnam thinks that this theory isn't particularly good because we would have to, you know, because our concept of pain is something that cuts across species, right? We think not only humans can be in pain, but also at least other biological animals, right? Cats and dogs and dolphins and aardvarks and I don't know, whatever, right? All sorts of different things. Uh, certainly seem like they can be in pain, Right, if you just observe them and, and we give a, a description of what's going on, right? When they have certain experiences, right? They're getting eaten or clawed or right, a bad thing is happening that doesn't seem conducive to their bodily integrity and flourishing. Um, they try to withdraw from that stimuli unless they have a really good reason not to, right? They're, you know, they're getting clawed, but by something they're trying to eat, right? They're trying to kill something for dinner. Um, because, our, our concept of pain and, and feeling pain applies across species. If we adopted the brain state theory, that would require us to uh, identify some physical chemical brain state that all organisms, all biological organisms could have to qualify as being in pain. So basically, if we found organisms, right, other animals, that acted as if they were in pain and it seemed perfectly obvious to all of us that they were in pain at certain times and not at others, but their brains weren't in the way that human brains are when we think we're in pain, then the theory would dictate that in fact, those animals weren't really in pain. 
which seems weird. Putnam thinks that that itself really speaks against the brain state theory. And of course, then there's a question as well, are we gonna find some single brain state that all humans share when they're in pain? I don't take my word on this, but I'm, I'm reasonably confident that uh, you know, research in the last 20, even probably longer than that, uh, 30 years, has shown that in fact, brain states can differ uh, amongst humans even though when they're, they're reporting the same thing, a toothache or whatnot. Now, like I said, do not take my word for that. But again, this, this brain state theory would really require us to find some single brain state that all beings in pain, or at least in a certain kind of pain, would have to share. The functionalist theory, by contrast, is more flexible. Right? Any potential organism, again, including, right, uh, um, Robots, right? Metallic organisms, things like Chappie, right? Digital ones um, can have mental states, right? They can feel pain, they can think, they can do whatever if they function, right? Really behave in the correct kinds of ways in response to the right sorts of stimuli, right? They have the same kind of input output functions that, that we have um, that, right? You know, you, you get roughly the same sorts of predictions, right? Of course, adjusting for the different sorts of factors about what would actually hurt them and not be conducive to their bodily integrity and flourishing and so on. One quick note here, Putnam does say that the functionalist theory is compatible with dualism. Dualism is sort of an older philosophical theory of mind and perhaps one that's still some, certainly somewhat popular. Um, just, you know, most people who are, aren't doing like philosophy of mind, but just think about minds that minds and, and thinkings and feelings and all the things that minds do are something separate from uh, physical processes. Right? So this would be another objection to the brain state theory that um, you know minds just aren't brain states, there's something more to it. The feeling of pain is something other than being in a particular kind of brain state or even a, a kind of functional state. Putnam says, you know, the, the functionalist theory is really agnostic about whether or not there's extra, like, spooky ghost mind stuff out there. Um, you know, Putnam basically shrugs and says, well, look, you know, maybe. And if there is, um, the functionalist theory is really no worse for where. You know, that, that would be problematic for the brain state theory because the brain state theory is trying to say thinks and feels and, and all that really are just referring to a kind of brain state. But the functionalist theory isn't. Instead, we're talking about really the, the whole organism, how it reacts to its environment, how it you know, deals with inputs and outputs and um, the, the probabilities that are related there. Uh, and if there is some kind of you know, spooky you know, mind stuff, and this is where you, know, you might want to attribute that to the soul somehow, uh, well, there's a pretty good question. How do you know positively that something like Chappie doesn't have one? And of course, this is something Vincent also gives um, some articulation to that, you know, Chappie, I don't remember the exact terms, but, you know, soulless or, or godless or, or something like that, right? But he's got, in some sense, a religious objection to artificial intelligence. But of course, so far as I know, we have no, um, I'll, I'll use the term scientific or at least, uh, you know, publicly available way of identifying what sorts of things have souls and which don't. Right? We don't have any kind of detector or, or anything like that, right? Do I have a soul? I, I'm not sure. I certainly haven't seen one. I don't think I've seen evidence of one. Does that mean I don't have it? No, right? Just means I, I don't know any sort of evidence for it or against it, really, right? Uh, so the similar, similar sorts of considerations could apply to Chappie and other sorts of machines. Now, one other remark on that uh, uh, second point there. Sorry, went ahead there. Um, there's another theory that Putnam rejects, which is behaviorism, uh, which is the view that, in fact, to be in a certain kind of mental state, you know, feeling pain or thinking something, is really just to behave in a certain kind of way. So to be in pain is, is just to, you know, try to take yourself away from the pain stimulus or whatnot. Putnam thinks that's also not a very good view. In fact, maybe a worse view than the brain state view, um, because it again, it would seem to have, require a, a certain set of behaviors that always have to be exhibited when um, something is actually in pain. And he says, he gives this example, you know, look, if somebody, you know, if we had two individuals 
and and they were completely de you know immobilized somehow right um i think he says you know like their nervous system is, is cut off somehow or, you know there's we give them some kind of drug or something so they're totally paralyzed but one of them's able to feel pain and the other one isn't right but neither of them can actually do anything about it he says there's sense to be made that one can feel pain and the other one doesn't but on the behaviorist view that's just not not the case because neither of them do anything about it they don't actually um, um, feel the pain so the functionalist theory is, is more flexible it's also not committed to full determinism right that we have to be able to tell 100 percent what's going to happen next um, which really seems to fit our, our epistemic status right we we don't know what other organisms what other people what other animals are going to do when something happens we can make predictions about it Similarly with Chappie, do we know what he's going to do next? No, not really. And you know, perhaps even the, the there are different points in the film where this can come up. I think particularly near the end, right, where he doesn't want to use violence, he doesn't want to use guns, he's not supposed to do it, he made a promise and so on. But of course, then his family is in danger, um, right, from the moose as well as the hippo. Um, so he he fights back. Right? He he does eventually fight back. Could we know ahead of time that that's what he was going to do, right? I don't think so. Not certainly not with any certainty. All right. Last uh, point here. I just went and changed the title here. I think I'm probably going to change these slides slightly, at least for the the titling for uh, when I post them. So, in looking at the the benefits of functionalism, we're just looking at some. So I think I'll probably retroactively apply a title there. Um, he also turns to some methodological considerations near the end of the piece. Here again, I'll try to keep my remarks fairly brief um, just to give some sense of what he's doing. I'll, I'll just sort of stick them up and talk about them here. Um, Putnam claims that functionalism is um, compatible with psychology in an interesting sort of way. So of course the brain state theory is um, certainly compatible with neuroscience. And in fact, neuroscience would be the place to look to see if the brain state theory holds true amongst humans, or in fact, if it's false, right? When we do tests and, and look at humans in pain and different sorts of pain, do we always find the same sorts of brain states or not, right? If we don't, uh, that seems like really good evidence that in fact, the theory is false. If we do, then it seems like evidence that that theory is true, at least, at least in some sense, right? Uh, they'll open a revision. Psychology is not neuroscience, right? Uh, again, there could be interesting overlaps between the two, but psychology is not committed to simply studying how the brain works, right? So psychology is, uh, has an interesting connection with the functionalist theory because psychology is interested in um, these questions of, of input-output relations, right? Um, if, you know, Carl's sitting there and he's happy and then he gets suddenly slapped in the face, what's likely to happen? Well, there are all sorts of questions about what, what might be relevant to predictions about that and so on. Uh, and this is where the, the claims about, you know, functional states and the descriptions of the probabilistic automata um, really become the, the laws of psychology. Really, what psychology is trying to do is figure out how those things work in humans. Uh, the second point here, um, the functional state really, uh, on Putnam's view, right, on, on the functionalist view, it's not just correlated with um, what's going on, but it really just is, right? It, it actually explains uh, things like pain behavior for the organism. So when we talk about, you know, pain behavior, what, what things like Chappie or, or humans do when we're in pain, right? Uh, one view is that, okay, the, those behaviors we have are correlated with being in pain. Being in pain is some other thing, right? But for functionalism, really, the, the functional state, including the behavior, is just really what it is. We say, you know, oh, Chappie's in pain or Carl's in pain. What we're saying is that there's certain sensory inputs, right, that the, the organism was in a certain kind of state, and now that there are certain behaviors going on, pain behaviors, right, certain sorts of outputs. Right, that are, are predictable based on what's going on. And, and then lastly, and this comes back to what we're talking about language at the start, uh, what Putnam considers to be um, fruitless questions get excluded, right? You know, when we ask what is pain or what causes pain, 
uh, really what we're talking about, you know, what causes pain? Well, we're talking about certain inputs, right? When you have a, a organism under a certain description and they get a certain kind of input, right? Well, there, that, that's what causes pain. What is pain? To be in a certain kind of functional state, right? Um, to, to have a certain kind of input-output function being executed at a certain kind of time. So Putnam ends on a note concerning that, that third point. He says, in short, the identification of sensations with functional states is to be tentatively accepted as a theory which leads to both fruitful uh, predictions and to fruitful questions, and which serves to discourage fruitless and empirically senseless questions, where by empirically senseless, I mean senseless not merely from the standpoint of verification, but from the standpoint of what there in fact is. So it's not just a question, you know, if we want to say, no, pain is something more than those functional states. Part of what he's saying here is, well, how would we ever verify that? How would we ever check it out? What kind of empirical evidence would we ever have that pain is something more above and beyond than functional states, as his theory um, really advocates for, right? Uh, not only is there no good way of trying to figure out what what that is, right? There's no way to really test it or, or investigate it. Right? Um, Putnam himself here is suggesting that there really just is no corresponding part of reality. Or to have, you know, like, well, what is pain? And we want to say it's something totally different from the, the state of the organism, right? From the probabilistic automaton, something totally different from the kind of sensory input and the behavioral output it can have. It's something, right, um, sort of evanescent. This, this sort of spooky mind ghost stuff that you can never sort of see or feel or touch or, or meet in sensory experience. Um, this is really where he's sort of getting and saying, why are we so sure it's there, right? Why think that to be in pain is something over and above the kind of um, um, condition Chappie can be in? Sure, Chappie isn't a human, right? But Chappie is the sort of, of complex organism, the kind of probabilistic automaton, that can have that kind of probabilistic input-input function. So why deny that he can think or feel or right, be a, a conscious being like that? And of course, something I haven't touched on at all here is at the end of the film, and we're going to come back to this with, with personal identity, Dion has his consciousness transferred over into um, a, a robot body. Right, and of course, Chappie sort of figures out what consciousness is, and there's a little exchange where Dion says, oh, you can't just copy it, it's not just data. You know, consciousness is some other thing. Questionable, right, maybe. Uh, the functionalist theory, I think, would say no, right? I'm, I, I'm co if consciousness is something other than data, uh, that's only true because uh, it's, it's, you know, the set of input-output functions, right? What, Putnam put in that four sort of point list of, of what functionalism holds. Uh, sure, maybe that's something a little more than data, um, but it's a kind of system. And if you can copy the system and make it work in the right kind of way, then in fact, it, it is the same thing, right? Is the, the robot version of Dion at the end still Dion? Seems like it, but that's what we're gonna come to in the personal identity question. But the, of course, um, what we see at the end there you know, assuming it's possible that you can get Dion in a robot body and take Chappie from one robot body and stick him into another. Well, before Dion was in the robot body, right, I don't think any of us would want to say he wouldn't think or feel or, or have any other mental predicates that we would assign to humans, right? He's a normal thinking, feeling human being. When he goes into the robot body, do we suddenly have to deny that if we want to say machines can't think, right? It almost seems like we have to, if we want to say in the first place, that it wouldn't be possible for Chappie to think, and perhaps to feel, if in fact thinking and feeling come as a package, which again is something that we've, we've talked about a little bit here, but haven't fully explored, in part because it's a rich and interesting topic. I'm gonna to go ahead and wrap up my comments for today right here. So we've taken a look at Putnam, and uh, at least a brief look at how this topic comes up in Chappie. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll talk about Searle's alternative view where he wants to say, in fact, no, Chappie can't think. No, he can't feel. And I believe uh, if we take Searle and apply him to what we were just talking about, once Dion is in the robot body, Searle seems committed to saying that that version of Dion can no longer really think or feel. So we'll be back tomorrow with Searle and taking a look at that. Until then, stay well, have fun, and I'll see you later. Bye for now.